Hey there, my name is Ben Rodney from Ashray New York, and I want to welcome you to this episode of the Ashray New York Designer Series and the brand new Ashray New York YouTube channel. We'll be bringing you educational content, interviews, and chapter updates, and it'll be open to members and non-members alike, or anyone just interested in the HVAC industry or updates on our chapter. You can find us on LinkedIn, Instagram, and make sure to go to our website, ashrayny.org, where you can sign up for our newsletter, check up on chapter events, and hopefully even join us as a new member of the chapter. If you like what you see here, make sure to hit the subscribe button below this video, and then hit the bell to get notifications on any future updates to the channel. If you have any comments, questions, or conversation about this video, just leave them in the comment section. Thank you, and enjoy the episode. Thank you, Ben, uh, for the introduction. I, for those of you who uh, have not heard, my name is Anthony York with Cisco Hennessy. Uh, before joining Cisco, I was a mechanical engineer with the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey for 32 years. I want to thank you all for attending this webinar and giving me the opportunity to share what I have learned from the past disasters. I hope everyone is coping well with staying at home and social distancing. And we know COVID-19 have and will significantly change how we live and work. <clears throat> the current COVID-19 pandemic is the worst disaster in modern history from tragic loss of life, economic losses, and immeasurable disruption to personal lives and endeavors. And as we start reopening the economy and getting back to our lives, building owners and engineers are now faced with the new challenges on how to provide a safe environment for the building occupants. Now, this presentation that I'm giving, most of the material in this uh, webinar was uh, presented in 2018 National ASHRAE Winter Conference in Chicago. The seminar was sponsored by then the Technical Committee, TG2, Technical Group 2, HVAC Security. A little bit of history about this committee. It was formed after uh, September 11 by the ASHRAE Presidential Ad Hoc Committee for Building Health and Safety Under Extraordinary Incidents. TG2 be, uh, has just become uh, uh, technical group 2.10 and the name has changed to resiliency and security. The TC focus on engineering design principles for the resilience of built environments subject to extraordinary events, including mitigating consequential damages, remediation and recovery. TC 2.10 is responsible for chapter 59 in the HVAC application handbook and it is the Cognizant Committee for ASHRAE Publication Guideline 29 that deals with risk management of public health and safety in buildings. The TC include a new will include a new chapter in the future edition of ASHRAE Fundamental Handbook titled Resiliency in Built Environment. These are the uh, learning objectives of this webinar. And to me, the most important one is the last one, which would be uh, lesson learned from past events so that we can better prepare for a more secure future. Now, disaster generally fall into three categories, intentional, accidental, and natural. Someone might argue that climate changes are not natural, but are man-made, but others, but to some, the argument might be back is that it's the mother nature's way in responding to uncurbed human activities. All disasters can result in immediate delay or delayed uh, physical damages, loss of life and impact to health and life safety to building occupants, and as well as others that are outside the buildings. Uh, we will now revisit some of these past extraordinary events. Now, we started with uh, uh, the first one, which is the 1920 Wall Street bombing. That was caused by actually in a, uh, by a horse-drawn wagon carrying a hundred pound of dynamite with 500 pound of sharpener. And that resulted in 38 deaths and 143 injured. They never saw who was responsible for it, but it was uh, uh, accounted, accounted for uh, by the uh, social unrest after the post-World War I period. Oh, sorry. Okay. And the second is the uh, LaGuardia Airport bombing that killed 11 people in June 74. Uh, in 1993, World Trade Center uh, uh, bombing, uh, six people died from that uh, incident and more than 1,000 injured. 
and we'll talk more about this in detail uh, later. Uh, in 1995, there was a sarin gas attack in Tokyo subway system by a religious cult group uh, during rush hour that resulted in 12 deaths and over a thousand injured. Oklahoma bombing was a domestic terrorist act resulted in 168 deaths and 680 people injured. And 324 buildings were damaged in the 16 block radius. 9-11, Terror terrorists hijacked four commercial jets resulting in 2,996 deaths and 25,000 people injured. 9-11 has forever changed our world and now we have to live with added security measures that is part of our everyday lives. And then we followed by all the uh, different uh, various mass shooting that we have, uh, including Sandy Hook, Orlando nightclub and Las Vegas. These horrific, horrific violent acts that demonstrate vulnerability exist anytime and, and, and anywhere. Added securities become necessary at all places and events. And now we can look at some of the you know, term accidental events. Uh, in 1949, Holland Tunnel uh, uh, had a fire that's caused by a truck carrying industrial solvent that was ignited and caused one death and 66 injuries. And in 1963, that uh, in, uh, during uh, Halloween night, there was a propane, a propane gas leak explosion and killing 74 people and injured more than 400 people. And then we have the MGM grand fire uh, in 1980 that resulted in 87 deaths and 7, 000, uh, 700 injured. Lesson learned from this event result in many changes in building codes that are still uh, uh, being used today. And in outside of our country, in the uh, 1984, there's a pest, uh, pesticide plant explosion in Bopo, India, and it, which is a union carbide uh, pesticide plant. And the explosion was considered to be the worst industrial disaster with over 3,787 deaths and five, over 550,000 people injured due to exposure of methyl isocyanate gas. Chernobyl is the worst nuclear power uh, plant accident, uh, resulting in contaminating over 39,000 miles of land all over Europe, but mostly in Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia. And there are old, over 40 immediate deaths due to blast trauma and acute radiation syndrome. And then there are tens of thousands of people suffer from long-term health effects from the radiation. In 1994, in Addison, New Jersey, a backhoe accidentally uh, uh, broke a 36-inch natural gas transmission pipe uh, and caused an explosion and damaged 14 apartment buildings and 15,000 residents were evacuated. Uh, fortunately, nobody was killed in this incident. And because of this incident, the, uh, uh, the uh, one core system has been, was enacted as a national practice. And then in um, 2011, we have the Fukushima uh, nuclear plant disaster, which is the second uh, worst nuclear power plant accident. And that uh, two people died at the plant and 83,000 people were evacuated. And more than 150 miles of ocean floor was contaminated because of the incident. And in 2018, which is a very uh, relatively minor incident uh, that causes flooding in the uh, Candy Airport uh, 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 International Arrival Building, also called Terminal 4. And that was caused by a, a frozen sprinkler pipe that was installed in an unheated space. And this, the flooding uh, caused the terminal uh, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to be shut down and evacuate because of the water is flooded the uh, baggage claim area so that pe uh, planes were not able to land and people cannot get the luggage. And this relatively minor incident caused major disruption to air travel around the world for many days. Now, to visit some of the uh, natural disasters, um, 
The first one I have is the Galveston uh, hurricane, which happened in 1900. And it was a category four hurricane with 145 miles wind. There were 8,000 deaths that was officially reported. And some say more and then some more up to even 12,000. And the San Francisco earthquake in 1906 resulted in 3,000 deaths and 80% of the city was damaged and destroyed. And many of them was because of the subsequent fire that was uh, after the earthquake. And in 1989, the Loma Prieta earthquake, uh, which is also known as the 1989 World Series earthquake, and that resulted in 63 deaths and 3,800 injuries. And then we have Katrina, uh, uh, which is uh, with a category five hurricane uh, up to 174 miles per hour wind. There were 1,833 fatalities and $125 billion in damages. And then we have Sandy that hit us uh, very hard back in, <clears throat> sorry, uh, 2012. And that was a category three hurricane with 115 miles wind. There were a total of 285 fatalities in our region and $70 billion in damages. And it's considered as the third costliest, costliest hurricane. In 2015, uh, locally, we have a uh, Legionnaire disease outbreak in New York City that resulted in 10 deaths with over 100 injuries from respiratory illness. In 2017, Hurricane uh, Harvey and Maria resulted in the worst uh, uh, hurricane, the most expensive hurricane in US history with 295 billions in damages and 3,364 deaths. And uh, more recently, we had the California fires and that was, which consists of uh, over 8,527 fires and with a total loss of 1.9 million acres was destroyed. There were a total of 97, uh, fatal uh, 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 97 civilian fatalities as well as six firefighters killed. Now, we are currently in the COVID-19. The current, I uh, just checked the current death count uh, uh, worldwide is about 350,000 now and with just, uh, and this now has been over 100,000 in the US alone. So when we are not even anywhere close to est estimate what is the economic damages that, ha that is caused by this event. So now we're going to dwell a little deeper in some of these past disasters as I have some of the experience with them uh, uh, in my uh, design work as mechanical engineers. Uh, so in 1949, um, there was a truck entering the Han Tunnel from New Jersey. And about one third into the tunnel, uh, one of the chemical container fell off and then it was ignited by a, another truck behind it. And, <clears throat> and the, uh, the, the fire, well, well the Port Authority uh, as well as the Jersey City and New York City Fire Department responded quite quickly and were able to evacuate and extinguish the fire and with uh, relatively minor injur uh, injuries. The only person that died was a fireman, which uh, died a few days later after the fire because of smoke inhalation. And there were 66 people injured. The tunnel has a, uh, what they call a fully transverse system and they activated at the full capacity. So that helped to uh, uh, dilute the uh, the fire uh, well the uh, the smoke and enable the firemen to go in to put out the fire and also they use that there are cross passages between the north and south tube in the Han tunnel and so the people from one tunnel where the fire is they can cross over to the other tunnel uh, as a temporary safe uh, to temporary safety so now this is a picture of the actual incident of that. Over here, you can see the uh, truck that was already uh, totally get burned out. And also another thing you can see is the damage that was done to the ceiling of the tunnel that's totally destroyed. Here is a, uh, a schematic of the uh, tunnel uh, ventilation system. Holland and Lincoln Tunnel has 
four ventilation buildings with a total of uh, 84 uh, supply and exhaust fans that used to uh, 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 ventilate the tunnel during normal operation. So what happened is that you have supply air going into supply air chamber, and then the air will be uh, supplied into the roadway level and it will dilute with the tailpipe gas and the heated gas and, and polluted gas will be exhausted out through the top uh, exhaust uh, plenum and then that will be and then that eventually exhausts out into the uh, 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 through the ventilation building so when we were th when they were saying that when people can cross passages is at every of these ventilation buildings they have cross passages that they can go from one tube to the other tube at these four locations. Now, another thing that was mentioned was the, um, oh, well, anyway, so this is the, uh, a cross-sectional view of the tunnel where you can see the supply air, fresh air plenum below, and then these are supply air flu that come out from the side of it, and then this is exhaust. The, um, uh, as we mentioned before, that they uh, uh, maximize the ventilation in here so that people can, uh, uh, the firemen can ex exhaust the air out. But this might not be a perfect solution because what that happened is that the, the smoke will just tend to spread out all over the place. And they were looking at this uh, uh, afterward and you know, determined that the fire size was not really that big, even though the toll destroyed the ceiling, but but it could have been much worse if the fire was uh, larger. So the lesson learned from this event is that for a lot of the roadway tunnel, they restrict trucks from carrying hazardous material, especially during certain time of day where the traffic was heavy. and and um, over the years, the tunnel have been improved and the fan has been upgraded and, 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 and NFPA 502 was developed in the 1970s, which is a standard for the safety for road tunnel bridges and other limited access highway. And one of the uh, concept for uh, uh, being uh, for the life safety is that we developed a uh, smoke management system that allowed uh, creation of a critical velocity. So what happened is that that would allow people to egress in the uh, direction of a fresh airstream, so where smoke will not back layer to uh, the direction of travel. That also enabled the uh, first responder to be able to get to the in front of the fire and, and put out the fire. Also another thing, uh, creative uh, idea that what came out was that they have fusible ceilings, exhaust panel on the top of the, uh, uh, of the exhaust plenum. And what happened is that if there's a fire coming out, these panel will be kind of melted and therefore create a larger opening where there you'll have a much higher exhaust rate right over where the fire occur. So, and also another thing that we uh, that got out from this is that the uh, different agencies uh, with uh, uh, roadway tunnels conduct live fire drills uh, uh, and all the uh, uh, participant, for example, in uh, Han Tunnel, they have people from Jersey City, uh, fire department from Jersey City and New York Fire Department to coordinate how, how to put out the fires uh, um, uh, and also to uh, uh, make sure the people get evacuated. And more importantly, that our tunnel operator will know how to uh, uh, control the smoke sequence uh, based on operating the uh, supply and exhaust fan to create the critical velocity that we just mentioned. Now, in 1993, uh, the World Trade Center bombing, um, it started <clears throat> uh, uh, with a uh, truck carrying um, fertilizer. Uh, uh, I think it's over a thousand, uh, 1500 pound fertilizer, and it was exploded at the B2 level of the parking garage. And that explosion knocked out the main electrical power lines and emergency generator uh, in the building. Uh, the, the emergency generator was not knocked out per se, 
but because of the cooling water system that was in the basement, uh, the line was broken and the uh, emergency generators uh, uh, only worked for a very short period of time. And because of the, um, uh, the explosion, the smoke was traveling through the stairwells as well as the elevator shaft um, uh, uh, to the tower and causing a very long, slow uh, evacuation for the occupants in the uh, towers. And also the explosion disrupted the communication system. Um, now, there were six people killed that were uh, workers at, uh, at the building, in the, uh, actually near the basement there in the B1 level, I believe. And some people were trapped for more than five hours. So this is a uh, cartoon that was uh, made after the bombing. So what you see is that this is at the B2, uh, sorry, this is at the B2 level where the, uh, the truck was exploded and it causes a uh, floor step collapse on the level above as well as uh, all the uh, uh, slab collapse all the way down to the B5 level. The B5 level is where the central cooling plant, Chola plant, where uh, uh, they had 49,000 ton of uh, Cholas in here. The Cholas fortunately were not really damaged. There was only uh, uh, one of the pipe was broken. And down here, this is where the uh, jet emergency generator were and um, the uh, water cooling pipe was broken here. So therefore it was not able to sustain operation because of the overheating. From the explosion, the, uh, the, uh, the smoke get carried through from the uh, elevator shaft because it was actually uh, was compromised at that point. And then the smoke just simply traveled throughout the tower. And that actually happened in uh, February 26, 1993, and because of the winter time, this there was extremely strong stack effect in the building, and the elevator shaft just simply just go through uh, over 1,200 feet uh, of of shafts that 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 simply become a huge chimney, and uh, there's smoke leakage everywhere in the building, and make it very difficult for the people to egress. Here we have is a photo of the actual uh, 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 collapse of the floor slab. And I think this is actually the uh, B2 level. And then, uh, and then look down enough, there is uh, the, uh, all, the, these are all the cars that were parked there. And then down below is the Chola plant. This is a picture of the, uh, this is the, uh, the uh, entrance of the One World Trade Center, or also known as the North Tower, uh, going to the West Street. And um, now the things that, that people that, it, I think that on the average people uh, evacuate the building anywhere from 40 minutes to up to five hours. And it was a very long process. So the lesson learned from, from the 93 bombing is that we, uh, we are trying to find out, okay, how does the smoke travel when you have an event like this, where smoke travel from the basement all the way up? And then we actually did some computer model and then to try to understand the stack effect and how it make the uh, situation worse. And also the thing is that there are different uh, season or different uh, winter, uh, how the smoke will behave will be very much different in winter time as well as in summer. And then, uh, and then we have developed smoke control sequencing that will allow and counteract some of these stack effects. And uh, another takeaway that we had from, from this uh, event was that we installed backup battery lighting and, uh, and exercise uh, throughout to help the people egress because we, uh, for the most part, we were egressing in a very wet uh, uh, and very dark uh, stairways. So, and, and, si and since the uh, 93, uh, the uh, Port Authority has conducted regular building evacuation drills and even simulate some of the major event. They actually have people over the weekend to simulate a, a mass evacuation on the building. And, <clears throat> 
also they have improved the fire protection and fire alarm system because the building was built in the uh, was designed in the 60 and built in the 70s and many of the uh, fire protections were substandard by today's standard and then of course the things like that that also changes the physical security people uh, after that all the tall buildings require people to check in and get security pass and make sure that they belong that they are going to building where they belong and from my personal point of view, I really think that because of the 93 event, as sad as it was, that it much prepared us better of, uh, for what happened in 9-11. Because without that practice, I think a lot more people would have died from the 9-11 event. <clears throat> so we go, go to, in 2012, the Superstorm Sandy. Uh, that was the fourth curse caused this hurricane in U.S. history, as we mentioned, and all the area airports, subway, tunnel bridges were shut down. And then uh, there was extended power outage for many days, up to a week or two, I believe. That was uh, in 17 states. There were a uh, uh, we need 15. Uh, there were 15 days of gas rationing because the um, because the uh, uh, gas station do not have power to pump the gas out to fuel the car and um, then u.s trading was actually suspended for two days and that was the first time that ever happened in u.s history until now uh, and then the many of the hospital in the area were shut down and the patient need to be evacuated and that is because the emergency generators were a lot of the emergency generator even if they were not located uh, at the basement level they, the fuel tank were, and they were flooded and, uh, and, and, and rendered a lot of these hospitals not uh, occupiable and cannot serve the public. So, and also as a, as a result from the uh, Superstorm Sandy, there's 17.3 million square feet of office, office space in lower Manhattan were, flood, uh, because, uh, were empty because of the flooded basement. He will have a, uh, a map that, uh, that was uh, uh, put out by FEMA that indicated all the flood lines, the different uh, uh, flood level lines, uh, uh, elevations of the uh, flood prone area. So the orange are the one that will be the first stage and second stage. And, um, and it's just proved that you know, we are in an area where uh, we, if another event like this happened, it would also be very uh, costly to us for future damage. And there have been quite a bit of work been done to uh, fortify uh, how we respond to uh, the next flooding. For example, many of the tunnel, they put flood doors in to prevent from water from flooding in until the water recede. And um, as well as a flood wall has been put in place and so forth. This is a picture of the uh, entryway to the uh, Brooklyn Battery Tunnel, which is an underpass access way before the um, Brooklyn, uh, uh, no, sorry, uh, yep, the, 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 uh, the Brooklyn, uh, what's it called, the Brooklyn Tunnel. And then this is a picture of LaGuardia Airport where uh, the taxiway were all flooded and the airport was not usable for a long, long time because of the uh, of the uh, uh, bay water actually flood into the airfield. So the lesson learned from Sandy is that <clears throat> building and critical facility need to be designed for resiliency against the natural disasters. So and and. For many buildings, we have to make sure that the critical infrastructure, for example, the generators, the mechanical system, the emergency generators, the uh, switch gears, the transformers, need to be above above the uh, uh, above the, uh, uh, the the floodplain levels, uh, so that you know, to ensure that these build, uh, building can bring back to service in a uh, relative relatively short period of time and prevent, uh, make sure that uh, some pumps are working when they need to be. And then, as I said, that floodgates 
uh, installed in various uh, subgrade structures and tunnels to prevent intrusion of water or to minimize the intrusion of uh, water. And, and then there's various steps on uh, how to recover from such event. So uh, FEMA, as well as other emergency response, local uh, uh, government have uh, established recovery plan on how to bring, uh, uh, how to recover from this situation. And another thing that was uh, important was that because the flood level was so high, the sewage was actually you know, backflow into the building and caused tremendous amount of damage and, 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 and delayed the opening of the buildings. And we need to have more reliable ba power backup system and also to provide a uh, power generator at the gas station. So <clears throat> with this, oh, sorry, next slide. With these, uh, lesson learned uh, so what can we do as engineers and uh, how we can uh, and how these events and what we have learned influence our design of the buildings designing against disaster is challenging because engineers are trained to solve problems if we were given a known problems, we will know how to solve them because that's the nature of how we, uh, uh, what we do, what we do, and how we do things. But without a metrics and without uh, a given guidelines and some of that, is, these are very difficult for us. And we know, uh, and, and sometimes we just have to uh, find our way or how to do these things. So, so mostly we relied on the building code, design standard, and guidelines because these are living documents that are constantly updated to respond to uh, man-made and natural disasters. And it's also important that for different type of buildings that we have to define what is the basis of design to include what would be the security and resiliency requirements specific to the building function and what they do and where they occupied. And and, and the thing is, like, but however, many of these things are constantly challenged by value engineering by the uh, building owner and developers. <clears throat> and more importantly is that the design for these extraordinary events should never comp uh, compromise the, uh, uh, the life safety of the system, including the fire protection system and, uh, and how we shut down the HVAC system during a fire and uh, all those. Uh, but they, but the, whatever we do should complement these system because of the risk is always be higher under these uh, normal hazard. Now we have, well, well, as we mentioned that you know, we have to design for resiliency. Resiliency can be meant by different things for different people or for different purposes, but sometimes so is, is, is the, the, the first step is preparedness to anticipate how the building will respond to a given threat or emergency. Sometime we will know, for example, with weathers, with a storm coming, we know uh, uh, we're pre advanced in terms of predicting the weather, uh, that a hurricane's coming, and then we will be shut down, evacuate the building uh, before that happens. And sometimes we don't have luxury of doing that if it is a terrorist act, that is just immediate effect. So the thing is like the preparedness of building should include uh, what should the building do? Are people, are they expect to shelter in place or do they uh, uh, include an evacuation? And just to a reflection on 9-11, uh, uh, sometimes evacuation is, uh, has to be kind of flexible. For example, that when the uh, North Tower was first struck in 9-11, uh, because of the uh, situation, because each tower has about 50,000 people. And the protocol that Port Authority had was that they want to make sure that the people from one tower would be evacuated safely and knowing the people from the other tower would be safe. But not knowing that the, uh, the, the second plane would hit just minutes after uh, the, uh, the, the uh, tower one. So, even though that was something that was well intended, but end up to be very costly because uh, a lot of people lost their life in Tower 2 because they weren't able to evacuate when uh, Tower 1 was first hit. 
So we have to kind of be uh, flexible in terms of when the event happened to know rather than go follow a script, somebody has to make some uh, uh, first, last, uh, I mean, uh, uh, immediate uh, 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 decision to decide what is the best course of action. And resiliency also in terms of how the building can absorb and mitigate the impact of threat. A lot of the public building has been designed, has been retrofit for, let's say, for bombing and, and such, so that there is safe of distances, uh, distancing. And then you can see that a lot of buildings have bollards that prevent trucks from hitting the building and causing physical damage, or even simply uh, uh, so that the standoff distance are further away where a car, uh, where the car bomb might not have more uh, very severe impact to the building. And also it's important is that the post disaster recovery. When we design a building, we have to know how we can bring the building back in service as, uh, as fast as possible, where there's shelter in place or, um, or just to evacuate. Even when we evacuate, the building should need to be maintained of some sort so that when the building come back in, for example, now we're going through the COVID-19, that if the building have not, let's say, in the air, uh, not being air conditioned in the humid weather, then you have another set of problem with mold and mildew, where it causes another health hazard to the building occupants. Oops, let me. And 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 and, and sometimes it will be necessary to come uh, uh, to conduct a comprehensive risk assessment so that we will provide the, the correct or the most cost effective means of how to uh, design for the recency for the buildings. And recency also bring in additional challenges with uh, what we have to deal with in the sustain sustainability requirements as well as high performance uh, uh, in, uh, in the energy uses of the building because some of these resilience measures uh, uh, may it be in direct conflict and not at, uh, able us to meet some of these uh, sustainability goals. Well, it is important to know your building, whether it's a new building or an existing building, uh, because, and also different uh, buildings behave differently under different various conditions. Different buildings have different operation requirements, uh, whether it's public, private, whether it's office, a dormitory, hotels, they, these are all have very different unique requirements. And, now, the, uh, there, there are many different things that we can, uh, that, that, that the important to know the building, so that the, uh, and also is important in many cases, for example, when, when we talk about the uh, uh, Han Tunnel fire as well as the uh, 93 fire, it is important that we will provide a safe condition for the first responder to be able to uh, go in the building and protect their life and help them to be more effective in, uh, in, the, in the rescue effort as well as uh, putting out fires. <clears throat> And it is also important to conduct regular fire drills. We always need to test our building system for normal emergency operations. And, and if you have a very old building, a retro commissioning would be a, uh, would be a good idea to make sure that the BMS is, uh, the building management system is functioning the way they are. So when you push a button that you, that uh, where the damper need to be closed are closed and where the fan need to be shut off are shut off and so forth. And also what we can also do with a new, with, a, with an old building or new design is to uh, employ new technology in building security system and sensor. Some of these sensor may be uh, uh, perimeter intrusion detection that they know that people might be a certain area that for example, like near uh, uh, an air intake of building, then those are secure and make sure that all the mechanical rooms are secure so that people cannot go in and mess around with it. And then uh, there's building information management system and assets management system 
that would be important and it could be very helpful in enhancing how we re uh, be response and prepare for the, the disaster. Because with this system, we will be able to keep up the maintenance of the of the uh, HVAC equipment or other building equipment, generators and um, uh, others uh, like safety equipment that make sure they are always working and then that they, they will be reliable when we need them. And most important is that we have to know the uh, vulnerability and risk specific to the building. And, and, and now with today's, that, that would also include cybersecurity. With our BMS is really sometimes is an open platform that uh, uh, hackers can get into cyber, uh, cybersecurity uh, with, with our building, how they operate in uh, security, the HVAC system and everything, so forth. And that will compromise a lot of the uh, measure that we might have put in the building. Now, however, there is a story that I want to uh, mention that there is a large uh, a public facility that after 9-11, uh, they have looked into putting a lot of uh, chem bio uh, 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 countermeasures that in case of a release of, uh, of a, a chem bio agent, the building will shut down at different locations and, and uh, try to protect the uh, occupants. But the thing is that after many years that nobody uses these systems and uh, because of the, uh, all these uh, operation manual is uh, uh, confidential and privileged documents, after many years, that people forget about how these things work. And then this special function that was programmed into building management system, uh, people don't even know they exist. And then they're afraid that to push any button because it might, uh, might not work the way it's supposed to work. So, now I just have to kind of get, uh, 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 go through the presentation a little bit faster uh, so just to close this uh, presentation. And now they are building, they are, uh, have high priorities, especially where the densely populated, where there's high uh, profile uh, uh, buildings, that's including airport, rail station, public transportation centers, bus terminals, and so forth in the list. But the thing is that we also been hit by something that are not in the high list, for example, like sports stadium, entertainment, amusement parks, maybe, uh, hospitals, and so forth. And these are all uh, 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 places where we should secure, especially uh, in response to a uh, uh, situation as demonstrated we have in COVID-19, that um, a lot of these area uh, even though, for example, like the convention centers and churches have been converted to a uh, makeshift hospital uh, to deal with the, uh, uh, the situation. So anyway, I just quickly run through, these are some of the resources and guidelines that exist uh, for, uh, uh, for uh, as references on how to make the building more secure. So we have the uh, uh, DOD, Department of Defense guidelines on how to uh, do anti-terrorism anti standard for buildings. And this is mostly for uh, federal buildings, but they have been used also for other high target buildings or, or uh, uh, building that is important. And then we all have something that published by American Society of Civil Engineers. And then they have a rating system that rate how, secure, how the building should be secure. And they have different rating based on bronze, silver, gold, and platinum. And with the bronze, they will just make sure that the ventilation equipment is, uh, is away from the high risk area, from loading dock garages, mailroom lobbies, and, and go so on. Again, these are just ideas that these are not enacted in, by any standard or any means, but it's just some, a good resource to see what other people are doing. And then we have uh, application chapter 59 that, that's, uh, that is actually uh, part of uh, uh, TG, uh, uh, TC 2.10 that we addresses in terms of the risk evaluation, how we look at uh, do how we should uh, conduct a risk management in terms of how to, to evaluate what is the measures. And if some of the things get value out, 
can we accept the vulnerability of certain things? So it's something that the building owners and uh, and um, uh, the uh, authority having jurisdiction need to consider uh, when they uh, uh, work on these buildings. And then we have guideline 29, which has just been revised in 2017. Uh, this guideline provide uh, again, uh, it's not prescriptive, but it provides some guidelines in terms of how to deal with different aspects of uh, uh, security. Uh, this guideline does not really provide too much in the resiliency, uh, but T, uh, TC 2.10 is actually working more to what the goal of resiliency. Uh, in the uh, subject of resiliency, there is a, actually a guideline called RELY 2.0, uh, which was uh, created uh, as part of the uh, uh, the lead standard, uh, the green building uh, 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 the, by the Green Building Council, and this actually this is, has a pretty uh, good guideline, but it might be a little bit tough to use, and uh, we do not know too many building that has act that there haven't been a lot of building that has been uh, rated or have been designed using these guidelines yet, but hopefully it's something that will be done in the future. And um, so now in terms of ASHRAE, what ASHRAE, the National ASHRAE is doing, uh, as part of TC 2.10, you know, uh, we are focusing more on resiliency, on bring the build, uh, uh, for the buildings. And um, we mentioned uh, 29, chapter 59, and then there will be a new chapter in the fundamental handbook that uh, that uh, focus in recency in the built environment. And also uh, during the, uh, the, uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, ASHRAE has formed a epidemic task force, which uh, TC 2.9 is also involved. Uh, to address you know, uh, the, the different measures that we can have. Uh, right now, I think we are at the stage where they are just collecting information and and and, and, and it's a clearing house of information and to say what works and what doesn't work and what needs to be studied more. So anyway, so this is conclude my presentations. So if anybody has any questions, I'm more than happy to take them. Okay, well, Anthony, thank you so much. That was uh, very informative. I think there was uh, parts of all different aspects of um, uh, resilient design and <clears throat> designing for different types of buildings that people could take. We don't have, we didn't get any um, questions from the audience. I guess my only question would be, are there any, uh, given your experience at the Port Authority, are there any say life, sa life safety or evacuation strategies for public areas, whether it's airports or bus depots, that you might want to point out that might be different than say a commercial building or any anything related to HVAC design, maybe just an example or two? Yeah, well, the thing is, is, uh, is, is all depends on the type of exposure it is. The, uh, the, again, uh, focus on prevention. Prevention is really the key to uh, a lot of these uh, measures. So the thing that physical security is always important, knowing who is coming in and uh, through the building, for example, the, the, the security checkpoint in uh, various airport uh, by the TSA as well as by the, uh, uh, by the police so that they have a, uh, there's a lot of things that you do not see that's actually in play in these places. For example, CCTV, uh, people keep monitoring where they are, any kind of suspicious uh, 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 activity can be monitored at the same time. Um, so th these are some, just uh, some of the, uh, the, the measure in terms of security. The, um, another thing is that a lot of the new buildings, uh, when they design it, they would put in uh, the air, let's say the outside air intake into more secure area and people cannot get into it. So uh, there is at least a minimum height where uh, the, the air intake will be uh, further away from public access. So people cannot easily throw something into the uh, outside air and, and, uh, and make it more difficult and more challenging for that. 
and there will be more different type of sensors, as I mentioned before, that allow people to uh, act quickly to shut down system. So for the most part, uh, most emergency shutting down, it might be something that is the first response that they do because that will be also coincide with how you would do deal with a fire situation. As I mentioned, one of the uh, important thing is that we should not counteract any like other life safety measure that's in place. For example, like if you have a fire, we don't want to say that, hey, this might be better as open. But the thing is that uh, uh, people who are doing this or the terrorists that's doing this, they might use a fire as a way to cause more panic while introducing other threats to the building. So that's a good for, point. Yep. So for for public building is uh, for, for let's say for commercial building, the uh, the again is is very different because you have different tenant, you have different visitors, you have different exposures. Uh, you have building have parking lots. You have building that's over uh, public transport facilities, these all pose an additional risk and different risk to them. So as a building owner, so what do you do? And many of these buildings, since they are old or existing, uh, maybe one of the preparedness that, that they can do is that how do we get the people out safely as fast as we could if outside is safe? So Right, save the people and save the, save the structure. Yeah. Um, so everyone, I since we are over on time, we're going to conclude there. So Anthony, thank you again. We really appreciate the presentation. He has his email up there on the screen at ayorkatsistica.com. If you have any questions for us at ASHRAE, you can reach us at ashrayenyc at gmail.com and visit us at ashrayny.org. So thank you very much. We hope you have a, a nice rest of the week and nice weekend. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Have a good one. Let's stay safe.